I'm back, baby. Acetic anhydride is a useful reagent to have in the laboratory. It provides easy access to acetate esters or amides, can convert other carboxylic acids to their corresponding anhydrides, and can also be used in Friedel Crafts acylations. Unfortunately, its versatility also finds applications in unlawful activities, which is why it's often hard to obtain for amateur chemists. Thankfully, it can be easily made from precursors, which, at least for me, are very easily purchasable. This synthesis is quite well known on YouTube and only uses acetyl chloride and sodium acetate. And while acetyl chloride can do mostly the same things as acetic anhydride, there are a few major differences. Chloride is a much better leaving group than acetate, which makes acetyl chloride a lot more reactive than acetic anhydride. This is very apparent when comparing their reactions with water. Acetyl chloride immediately hydrolyzes, which causes the temperature to quickly rise above 40 degrees, whereas the acetic anhydride remains at room temperature. If you look closely at the bottom of the test tube, there's actually a separate layer of acetic anhydride and it only disappears after about an hour. The second major difference and main reason I prefer the anhydride over the chloride are the byproducts created during reactions. Acetic anhydride releases acetic acid during reactions, which doesn't smell very nice, but otherwise it doesn't do much. Acetyl chloride releases gaseous hydrogen chloride, which corrodes every piece of metal in proximity, so you have to set up a gas scrubber for every reaction, and wherever you store it, there is always a circle of rust around, because the fumes will find a way out of the storage container and eat your cupboards. Have I mentioned I don't like acetyl chloride? Well, at least the sodium acetate is a good boy and does need my lab equipment. The commercial variant is sold as a trihydrate, which means there are three molecules of water associated with every molecule of sodium acetate. As we've seen, acetyl chloride reacts quite readily with water and it will just turn to acetic acid. So that water has to go before the reaction. I weigh out 286 grams of sodium acetate trihydrate and fill it into a 1 liter round bottom flask. At first I wanted to try distilling the water out of the reaction flask directly, as this would allow me to keep everything in a single container. And while mechanical strain works really well at the beginning, where the sodium acetate is a free-flowing powder, it will clump together into an extremely hard mass as the dehydration proceeds. Even a mechanical stirrer can't mix this, and it actually deformed from the high stress and temperatures but I managed to straighten it out again, so all is good. In total, I removed about 80 milliliters of water, which is around 50%, but I can't get any further like this. So I changed my approach to a much simpler one and scraped all of the sodium acetate into a glass dish and put it in the oven at 150 degrees. I should have just done this from the start since it works much better and after about two hours, all of the water is gone. During this drying process, the sodium acetate has lost more than 100 grams in mass and now weighs 171.5 grams, which is about the expected weight after complete dehydration. Now I can put everything back in the flask and set it up for the actual reaction with a KPG stirrer, a reflux condenser and an addition funnel, which is filled with 157 grams of acetyl chloride. Just look at all those hydrochloric acid fumes forming when pouring this stuff. I can practically taste the corrosion. Now I can slowly add the acetyl chloride to the flask, since this reaction is pretty exothermic and I don't want to overwhelm my condenser. Once again, the stirrer has no problems at the start, but as I continue to add acetyl chloride, the reaction mixture cakes up and becomes very hard. This causes a similar problem as before, where the stirrer has to push against a lot of resistance in the flask and starts to rotate and shake very violently. The reason for this is that the stirrer itself is connected to the shaft in the motor through a small piece of rubber tubing to give the connection a little bit of flexibility 
so it can compensate for small misalignments. Unfortunately, the hose is a little too flexible and when the stirrer has a lot of resistance, it will twist and cause the stirrer to rotate off center. This causes the flask to shake very heavily, which obviously isn't good, and I don't have an immediate way to fix this, so I circumvent it by adding a little bit of acetyl chloride and then turning on the stirrer for a short time to mix it in. This doesn't get rid of the problem, so it's not a permanent fix, but at least it minimizes strain on my equipment. Eventually, after adding most of the seal chloride, the goop starts becoming softer, and that finally alleviates the shaking, but I really need to find a better solution here. Now I will add the last bits of acetyl chloride, and then let this reflux to fully complete the reaction. And after that, we can separate the product by distillation. And here we have our crude acetic anhydride. If you look very closely, you can observe a slight yellow discoloration, which I'm pretty sure upsets an Australian chemist in a shed somewhere. All yellow chemistry is trash. There's even more yellow in the distillation flask, plus some burnt tar at the bottom, but most of the residue is just plain table salt. Although I would recommend using this to salt your food. The next step is to clean up the acetic anhydride by a fraction of distillation. The boiling point of pure acetic anhydride is 140 degrees Celsius, and at first I tried to use an oil bath, but the heat transfer is too shit. It does boil, but it can't get up the columns, so all we get in the receiving flask is just this painfully slow trickle. The oil is also already at 170 degrees, so I really don't want to push it much further. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to spend a week distilling this stuff. I'm gonna need something with a bit more power, so I switched the oil for my heating mantle. Now I can start pumping some heat into the flask, and that finally gets the distillation going. Heating mantles are a great thing, I should really get one for my smaller flasks. Now we have a total of three fractions and we can check their purity by measuring their refractive indices. The third fraction has a refractive index of 1.3885, which is only off by 0.0006 from the literature value. This is easily within the margin of error of this refractometer, so I can add this to my leftover anhydride for a previous run. The other two fractions, however, are a bit further away, so I want to distill them again before using them. Since this is only a very small amount of distillate, I don't need the big still for this and can instead use a smaller one.
After two more distillations, I have refined this fraction to a level of purity I am happy with. It's not quite as pure as the first one, but it's definitely good enough. So now we can combine everything and calculate the final yield. The amount of pure anhydride collected is 142.91 grams, which is a 69.63% yield. If we also include the impure fractions in this calculation, it's actually 80%, which is pretty good. Although these fractions will not be put into storage, they still contain a considerable amount of acetic anhydride, and it would be a shame to just toss them away. So instead, I'm gonna use them to make a few esters with some random alcohols I have in the lab. While searching through my storage cabinets, I found some 1 pentanol and 1 butanol, and on my workbench is a squared bottle with isopropanol. For this demonstration, I don't really care about stoichiometry, so I'm gonna add roughly equal parts of anhydride and alcohol to each test tube, and then a small drop of hydrochloric acid as a catalyst. To speed up the reaction, I will also heat it in a warm water bath. And that's basically it. Making esters with acetic anhydride is extremely convenient. Acetic anhydride is a good electrophile, and the alcohol will very easily react with one of the carbonyls. After that, acetate is eliminated as a leaving group, which is a pretty decent leaving group, and then we are left with the ester and acetic acid as a byproduct. And the best part is, this reaction is practically irreversible, so no worrying about equilibriums. The reaction should be done now, so we can take the test tubes out of the water bath, and then do a quick workup by adding some sodium bicarbonate solution to neutralize all of the acid, and washing it a little bit. And there you go. The upper organic layer is practically pure ester made in about 10 minutes. All of these esters have a fairly pleasant fruity smell. Except for this one, it just smells like glue. If you wanted to purify these, you can distill them at this point, but I don't have use for them, so I'm not gonna do that. And with that, we have reached the end of this video. As always, a huge thanks goes out to my patrons, who have supported me throughout this relatively long pause. I'll do my best to increase the frequency in between future videos. Next time, we'll be dealing with some metal organic chemistry, and doing our first grenade reaction on this channel. Until then, have a great time and we'll see each other again very soon.